on the book too. Chapter one. Many meetings. Frodo woke and found himself lying in bed. At first he thought that he had slept late after losing, after a long, unpleasant dream that still hovered on the edge of memory. Or perhaps he had fallen ill, but the ceiling looked strange. It was flat. It had dark beams richly carved. He lay a little while longer looking at patches of sunlight on the wall and listening to the sounds of a waterfall. Where am I and what is the time? He said aloud to the ceiling. In the house of Elrond, it is ten o'clock in the morning said a voice. It is the morning of October the 24th, if you want to know. Gandalf, cried Frodo, sitting up. There was the old wizard sitting in a chair by the open window. Yes, he said. I am here, and you are lucky to be here, too, after all of the absurd things you have done since you left home. Frodo lay down again. He felt too comfortable and peaceful to argue. In any case, he did not think he would get the better of, the, of an argument. He was fully awake now, and the memory of his journey was returning. The disastrous shortcut through the old forest, the accident at the prancing pony, and his madness in putting on the ring in the dell under Weathertop. While he was thinking of all of these things, and <clears throat> and trying in vain to bring his memory down to his arriving in Rivendell, there was a long silence, broken only by the soft, soft puffs of Gandalf's pipe, as he blew white smoke rings out of the window. "'Where's Sam?' Frodo asked at length. "'And are the others all right?' Yes, they are all safe and sound, answered Gandalf. Sam was here until I sent him off to get some rest, about a half an hour ago. What happened at the ford? asked Frodo. It all seemed so dim somehow, and it still does. Yes, it would. You were beginning to fade, answered Gandalf. The wound was overcoming you at last. A few more hours, and you would have been beyond our aid. But you have some strength in you, my dear hobbit, as you showed in the barrow. That was touch and go, perhaps the most dangerous moment of all. I wish you could have held out at Weathertop. You seem to know a great deal already, said Frodo. I have not spoken to the others about the barrow. At first it was too horrible, and afterwards were, there were other things to think about, so how do you know about it? You have talked long in your sleep, Frodo, said Gandalf gently, and it has not been hard for me to read your mind and memory. Do not worry. Though I said absurd just now, I did not mean it. I think well of you and of the others. It is no small feat to have come so far, and through such dangers, still bearing the ring. We should never have done it without Strider, said Frodo. But we needed you. I did not know what to do without you. I was delayed, said Gandalf, and that nearly proved our ruin, and yet I am not sure. It may have been better so. I wish you would tell me what happened. All in good time. You are not supposed to talk or worry about anything today by Elrond's orders. But talking would stop me thinking and wondering, which are quite as tiring, said Frodo. I am wide awake now, and I remember so many things that want explaining. Why were you delayed? You ought to tell me that, at least. You will hear all you wish to know said Gandalf. We shall have a council as soon as you are well enough. At the moment, I will only say, say that I was held captive. You? cried Frodo. Yes, I, Gandalf the Grey, said the wizard solemnly. There are many powers in this world for good or for evil, 
some are greater than I am. Against some I have not yet been measured, but my time is coming. The Morg Morgul, Morgul Lord and his black riders have come forth. War is preparing. Then you knew of the riders already, before I met them? Yes, I knew of them. Indeed, I spoke of them once to you, for the Black Riders are the Ring Wraiths, the nine servants of the Lord of the Rings. But I did not know that they had arisen again, or I should have fled with you at once. I heard news of them only after I left you in June, but that story must wait. For the moment, we have been saved from disaster by Aragorn. Yes, said Frodo. It was Strider that saved us, yet I was afraid of him at first. Sam never quite trusted him, I think. Not at any rate until we met Glorfindel. Gandalf smiled. I have heard all about Sam, he said. He has no more doubts now. Thank you for the follows. Fendike, welcome. Do I work for Christmas? I don't know, I have a wish list. That's all I can. <laughs> Just. We all smile mostly, though. Thank you for gifts. And why am I going backwards in this? It's more confusing. Thank you for the share. Merry Christmas. It is me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad, said Frodo, for I have become very fond of Strider. Well, fond is not the right word. I mean, he is dear to me, though he is strange and grim at times. In fact, he reminds me often of you. I don't know that any of the big- I didn't know that any of the big people were like that. I thought, well, that they were just big and rather stupid. Kind and stupid like Butterbur, or stupid and wicked like Bill Fernie. But then we don't know much about men in the Shire, except perhaps the Brelanders. You don't know much ab even about them if you think old Barlamen is stupid said Gandalf. He is wise enough on his own ground. He thinks less than he talks, and slower. Yet he can see through a brick wall in time, as they say in Bree. But there are few left in Middle-earth like Aragorn, son of Arathorn. The race of the kings from over the sea is nearly at an end. It may be, be, it may be that this War of the Ring will be their last adventure. Do you really mean that Strider is one of the the people of the old kings? Said Frodo in wonder. I thought they had all vanished long ago. I thought he was only a ranger. Only a ranger, cried Gandalf. My dear Frodo, that is just what rangers are. The last remnant of the north of the great people, the men of the west. They have helped me before, and I shall need their help in the days to come. For we have reached Rivendell, but the ring is not yet at rest. I suppose not, said Frodo. But so far my only thought has been to get here, and I hope I shan't have to go any further. It is very pleasant just to rest. I have had a month of exile and adventure, and I find that has been as much as I want. He fell silent and shut his eyes. After a while he spoke again. I have been reckoning, he said, and I can't bring the total up to October the 24th. It ought to be the 21st. We must have reached the ford by the 20th. You have talked and reckoned more than is good for you, said Gandalf. How do the side and shoulder feel now? I don't know, Frodo answered. They don't feel at all, which is an improvement, but... He made an effort. I can move my arm again a little. Yes, it is coming back to life. It, it is not cold, he added, touching his left hand with, its right, with his right. Good, said Gandalf. It is mending fast. 
You will soon be sound again. Elrond has cured you. He has tended you for days, ever since you were brought to him. Days? said Frodo. Well, four nights and three days, to be exact. The elves brought you from the ford on the night of the twentieth, and that is where you lost count. We have been terribly anxious, and Sam has hardly left your side day or night except to run messages. Elrond is a master of healing, but the weapons of our enemy are deadly. To tell you the truth, I had very little hope. For I suspected that there was some fragment of the blade still in the closed wound, but it could not be found until last night. Then Elrond removed a splinter. It was deeply buried, and it was working inwards. Frodo shuddered, remembering the cruel knife with the notched blade that had vanished in Strider's hands. Don't be alarmed, said Gandalf. It is gone now. It has been melted. And it seems that hobbits fade very reluctantly. I have known strong warriors of the big people, who would quickly have been overcome by that splinter which you bore for seventeen days. What would they have done to me? asked Frodo. What were the tri riders trying to do? They tried to pierce your heart with a mor morgul knife which remains in the wound. If they had succeeded, you would have become like they are, only weaker and under their command. You would have become a wraith under the, tr the dominion of the Dark Lord, and he would have tormented you for trying to keep his ring, if any greater torment were possible than being robbed of it and seeing it on his hand. Thank goodness I did not realize the horrible danger said Frodo faintly. I was mortally afraid, of course, but if I had known more, I should have not dared even to move. It is a marvel I escaped. Yes, fortune or fate have helped you, said Gandalf, not to mention courage, for your heart was not touched and only your shoulder was pierced, and that was because you resisted to the last. But it was a terribly narrow shave, so to speak. You were in the greatest peril while you wore the ring, for then you were half in the wraith world yourself and they might have seized you. You could see them, and they could see you. I know, said Frodo. They were horrible to behold, but why could we see all... see all... see their... Nah. Why could we all see their horses? Because they are real horses, just as the black robes are real robes that they wear to give shape to their nothingness when they have dealings with the living. Then why do these black horses endure such riders? All the other animals are terrified when they draw near, even the elf horse of Glorfindel. The dogs howl and the goose geese street scream at them. Because these horses are born and bred to, into the service of the Dark Lord in Mordor. Not all of, his, not all of its, his servants and chattels are wraiths. There are orcs and trolls, there are wargs and werewolves, and there have been and still are many men, warriors and kings, that walk alive under the sun, yet are under his sway, and their number is growing daily. Hello, Merry Christmas, thank you for Candy King. For present for football ice cream cracker. Hi, Jan. Listening while you write poetry? <laughs> I'm glad it helps, but I can't imagine trying to write and line background this. Perfect. <laughs> I am comfy, I'm with. Not your thing. Thank you for gift. Yeah. It is poofy. I'm so glad you exist. 
Well, I'm glad you all exist, too. It, yeah, it probably does. Listening for... Listening to listen, not listening to learn. Going down. What about Rivendell and the elves? Is Rivendell safe? Yes, at present, until all else is conquered. The elves may fear the Dark Lord and they may fly before him, but never again will they listen to him or serve him. And here in Rivendell, there that, the, and here in Rivendell, there live still some of his chief foes. The elven wise lords of the Eldar from beyond the furthest seas. They do not fear the ring wraiths, for those who have dwelt in the blessed realm live at once in both worlds, and against both the seen and unseen they have great power. I thought I saw a white figure that shone and did not glow dim like grow dim like the others. Was that Glorfindel then? Yes, you saw him for a moment, as he is upon the other side, one of the mighty of the firstborn. He is an elf lord of the house of princes. Indeed, there is such power in Rivendell to withstand the might of Mordor for a while, and elsewhere other powers still dwell. There is power, too, of another kind in the Shire, but all such places will soon become, become islands under siege. Things go on the way they are going. The Dark Lord is putting forth all his strength. Still, he said, standing suddenly up and sticking out his chin, while his beard went stiff and straight like bristling wire. We must keep up our courage. You will soon be well if I do not talk you to death. You are in Rivendell, and you need not worry about anything for the present. I haven't any courage to keep up said Frodo. But I am not worried at the moment. Just give me the news of my friends, and tell me the end of the affair at the ford, as I keep on asking, and I shall be content for the present. After that I shall have another sleep, I think, but I shan't be able to close my eyes until, I've, until you have finished the story for me. Gandalf moved his chair to the bedside, and took a good look at Frodo. The color had come back to his face, and his eyes were clear and fully awake and aware. He was smiling, and there seemed to be little wrong with him. But to the wizard's eye there was a faint change, just a hint, as if it, as it were of transparency about him. And, especially, and specifically, no, and especially, about the left hand that lay outside upon the coverlet. Still, that must be expected, said Gandalf to himself. He is not half through yet, and to what will he come in the end? Not even Elrond can foretell. Not to evil, I think. He may become like glass filled with a clear light for eyes to see that can. You look splendid, he said out loud. I will risk a brief tale without consulting Elrond, but quite brief, mind you, and then you must sleep again. This is what happened, as far as I can gather. The riders made straight for you as soon as you fled. They did not need the guidance of their horses any longer. You had become visible to them, being already on the threshold of their world. And also, the ring drew them. Your friends sprang aside off the road or they would have been ridden down. They knew that nothing could save you if the white horse could not. The riders were too swift to overtake. And too many to oppose. On foot, even Glorfindel and Aragon together could not withstand all the nine at once. When the ring wraith swept by, your friends ran up behind. 
Close to the fort, there is a small hollow beside the road, mar masked with a few stunted trees. There they hastily kindled fire, for Glorfindel knew that a flood would come down if the riders tried to cross, and that he would have to deal with any that were left on his side of the river. The moment that the flood appeared, he rushed out, followed by Aragorn and the others with flaming brands. Caught between fire and water? And seeing an elf lord revealed by his wraith, they were dismayed, and their horses were stricken with madness. Three were carried away by the first assault of the flood, the others now hurled into the water by their horses and overwhelmed. And is that the end of the Black Riders? Said, asked Frodo. No, said Gandalf. Their horses must have perished, and without them they are crippled, but the ring wraiths themselves cannot be so easily destroyed. However, there is nothing more to fear from them at present. Your friends crossed after the flood had passed, and they found you lying on your face at the top of the bank, with a broken sword under you. The horse was standing guard beside you. You were pale and cold, and they feared, and they feared that you were dead or worse. Elrond's folk met them, carrying you slowly towards Rivendell. Who made the flood? asked Frodo. Elrond commanded it, answered Gandalf. The river of this valley is under his power. And it will rise in anger when he has great need to bar the ford. As soon as the captain of the ring raids rode into the water of the rode into the water, the flood was released. If I may say so, I added a few touches of my own. You may not have noticed, but some of the waves took the form of great white horses with shining white riders, and there were many rolling and grinding boulders. For a moment I was afraid that we had let loose too fierce a wrath, and the flood would get out of hand and wash you all away. There's great vigor, vigor in the waters that come down from the snows of the misty mountains. Yes, it all comes back to me now, said Frodo. The tremendous roaring I thought was drowning with my friends and enemies at all. But now we are safe. Gandalf looked quickly at Frodo, but he had shut his eyes. Yes, you are all safe for the present. Soon there will be feasting and merrymaking to celebrate the victory at the ford of Brynan, and you will all be there in places of honor. Faden, we're going to go to Nindolan. Hello! I have no idea how long it takes to heat iron. Skill? Where do they have the time? Skill? I fall asleep peacefully on grass. Did I stumble on a large dash of firewood and killing? Does, does Eric on the night as a lumber check? Who knows? <laughs> I gonna add all those point put all the points in the fire making. <laughs> You'll all be there in places of honor. Splendid said Frodo. It is wonderful that Elrond and Glorfindel are such great lords, not to mention Strider. It should take so m not to mention Strider, should take so much trouble and show me so much kindness. Well, there are many reasons why they should, said Gandalf, smiling. I am one good reason. The ring is another. You are the ring bearer, and you are the heir of Bilbo the ring finder. Dear Bilbo, 
said Frodo sheepishly. I wonder where he is. I wish he was here and could hear all about it. It would have made him laugh. The cow jumped over the moon and the poor old troll. With that, he fell fast asleep. Coffee tank. I feel like Aragorn's hidden bonfire ability should have been used more often in these books. <laughs> Confetti. Morgan Betty. Frodo is now safe in the last homely house east of the sea. That house was, as Bilbo had long ago reported, a perfect house whether you like food, or sleep, or storytelling, or singing, or just sitting around and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all. Merely to be there was a cure for weariness, fear, and sadness. How do I get there? As the evening drew on, Frodo woke up again, and he found that he no longer felt a need of rest or sleep, but had a mind for food and drink, probably for singing and storytelling afterwards. He got out of bed and discovered that his arm was already nearly as it as useful again. As useful again as it ever had been. He found laid ready clean garments of green cloth that fitted him excellently. Looking in a mirror, he was startled to see a much thinner reflection of himself than he remembered. It looked remarkably like the young nephew of Bilbo who used to go tramping with his uncle in the Shire, but the eyes looked out at him thoughtfully. Yes, you have seen a thing or th seen a thing or two since you last peeped out of a looking glass, said to his reflection. But now for a merry meeting. He stretched out his arms and whistled a tune. At that moment there was a knock on the door, and Sam walked in. He ran to Frodo and took his left hand awkwardly and shyly. He stroked it gently, and then he blushed and turned hastily away. Hello, Sam, said Frodo. It's warm, said Sam, meaning your hand, Mr. Frodo. It has felt so cold through the long nights, but glory and trumpets, he cried, turning round again with shining eyes and dancing on the floor. It's fine to see you up and yourself again, sir. Gandalf asked me to come and see if you were ready to come down, and I thought he was joking. I, I am ready, said Frodo. Let's go and look for the rest of the party. I can take you to them, sir, said Sam. It's a big house, this, and very peculiar. Always a bit more to discover, with it, and no knowing what you'll find around a corner. And elves, sir. Elves here and elves there, some like kings, terrible and splendid, and some as merry as children. And the music and the singing. Not that I have had the time or the heart for much listening since we got here. But I'm getting to know some of the ways of the place. I know what you have been doing, Sam, said Frodo, taking his arm, but you shall be married tonight and listen to your heart's content. Come on, guide me round the corner. Sam led him along several passages and down many steps and out into, the, into a high garden above the steep bank of the river. He found his friends sitting on a porch on the side of the house looking east. 
Shadows had fallen in the valley below, but there was still a light on the faces of the mountains far above. The air was warm, the sound of running and falling water was loud, and the evening was filled with a, raint, with a faint scent of trees and flowers, as if summer still lingered in Elrond's gardens. Hooray! cried Pippin, springing up. Here is our noble cousin. Make way for Frodo, Lord of the Ring. Hush, said Gandalf from the shadows at the back of the porch. Evil things do not come into this valley, but all the same we should not name them. The Lord of the Ring is not Frodo, but is the master of the Dark Tower of Mordor, whose power is again stretching out over the world. We are sitting in a fortress outside. It is getting dark. Gandalf has been saying many cheerful things like that, said Pippin. He thinks I need keeping in order, but it seems impossible. Somehow, to feel gloomy or depressed in this place, I feel like I could sing if I knew the right song for the occasion. I feel like singing myself, laughed Frodo. Though at the moment I feel more like eating and drinking. That will soon be cured, said Pippin. You have shown your usual cunning in getting up just in time for a meal. More than a meal? A feast, said Mary. As soon as Gandalf reported that you were recovered, the preparations began. He has hardly finished speaking when they were summoned to the hall by the ringing of many bells. The hall of Elrond's house was filled with folk, elves for the most part, though there were a few guests of other sorts. Elrond, as was his cousin, sat on a great chair at the end of the long table upon the dais, and next to him, on one side sat Glorfindel, on the other side sat Gandalf. Hello! The Lord of the Ring is not Fred. Frodo looked at them in wonder, for he had never before seen Elrond, of whom so many tales spoke, and as they sat upon the right hand, his right hand and his and as they sat upon his right hand and his left, Glorfindel and even Gandalf, whom he thought he knew so well, were revealed as the lord as lords of dignity and power. Gandalf was shorter in stature than the other two, but his long white hair, his sweeping silver beard, and his broad shoulders made him look like some wise king of ancient legend. His aged face under the great snowy brows is in his aged face under the great snowy brows, his dark eyes were set like coals that could leap suddenly into fire. Glorfindel was tall and straight, his hair was of shining gold, his face hair and young his fi his face hair and young and fearless and full of joy. What? His face fair, young and fearless and full of joy. His eyes were bright and keen, and his voice like music. On his brow sat wisdom, and, at, and in his hand was strength. The face of Elrond was ageless, neither old nor young, though in it was written the memory of many things, both good and sorrowful. His hair was dark as the shadows of twilight, and upon it was set a circlet of silver. His eyes were grey as, as a clear evening. And in them was a light, like the light of stars.
Venerable he seemed as a king, crowned with many winters, and yet hale as a tired warrior in the fullness of, of his strength. He was the Lord of Rivendell, and mighty among both elves and men. In the middle of the table, against the woven cloths about the wall, there was a chair under a canopy, and there sat a lady fair to look upon. And so like was she in form of womanhood to Elrond, that Frodo guessed she was one of his close kindred. Young she was, and not yet so. The braids of her dark hair were touched by no frost. Her white arms and clear face were flawless and smooth, and the light of stars was in her bright eyes, gray as a cloudless night, yet queenly she looked, and thought and knowledge were in her grace. As of one who has known many things that the years bring, above her brow, her head was covered with a cap of silver lace netted with small gems, glittering white, but her soft rainy gray her soft grey raiment had no ornament save a girdle of leaves wrought in silver. It was so it was that Frodo saw her whom she, few mortals had yet seen, Arwen, daughter of Elrond, for whom it is said that the likeness of Lithuane had come up on earth again, and she was called Undomael, for she was the even star of her people. Long she had been in the land of her mother, mother's kin in Lorien, beyond the mountains, and it was but lately re and has but re and was but lately returned to Rivendell to her father's house. But her brethren Elendan and Elonhir were out upon errantry. For they rode far, often far afield with rangers of the north, forgetting never their mother's torment in the dens of the ones of the orcs. Same number of others. Such loneliness in living, such loveliness in living thing Frodo had never seen before nor imagined in his mind, and he was both surprised and abashed to find that he had a seat at Elrond's table, among all these folk so high and fair, though he had a suitable chair and was raised upon several cushions, he felt very small and rather out of place. But that feeling quickly passed. The feast was memory and the food all that his hunger could desire. It was some time before he looked about him again or even turned to his neighbors. <laughs>